Uh, Rolling Knoll Superfund Landfill is a 200 acre site in Chatham Township. It is a former landfill which operated from the mid 1930s through the late 1960s. Waste included household garbage, construction and demolition debris, septic waste, scrap metal, and industrial waste. Pesticides were also applied on the site. 35 acres of the landfill are part of the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge in the wilderness area. Parts of the landfill and the wilderness area are wetlands and flood hazard areas. The wilderness area and the landfill provide habitat for native mammals, fish, amphibians and reptiles, including endangered bog turtles, Indiana bats, and blue spotted salamanders. Landfill operations contaminated soil, sediment, surface water, and groundwater. After many years of investigation, the site was placed on the national priorities list and labeled a Superfund in 2003. One of the primary drivers for placing the site on the list was its proximity to the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. Establishing Rolling Knolls as a Superfund allows the EPA to clean up the site, including requiring the parties responsible for its contamination to pay for and perform the cleanup. Superfund law goals are to protect human health and the environment by cleaning up polluted areas, making responsible parties pay for the cleanup work, involving communities in the process, and returning sites to productive use. EPA has now identified the potential responsible parties called PRPs and has conducted a remedial investigation through soil and water sampling and a risk assessment. A feasibility study outlining five potential cleanup alternatives is about to be released, specifying a preference for one of those alternatives. The five alternatives are currently no action, which would have a zero cost, obviously. Second alternative, engineering and institutional controls, such as fencing, signage, and land use restrictions. That has a current dollar cost of $761,000. These numbers are from the EPA, by the way, which I believe came from the PRPs. Third alternative, capping selected areas to reduce the overall risk posed by the site, capping and or excavating additional areas that exceed allowances in soil to further reduce risk and or to prevent impacts to groundwater and engineering and institutional controls. Alternative three has a price tag ranging from 16.5 million to 21.1 million. Alternative four, excavation and offsite disposal of selected areas to reduce overall risk capping and or excavation of additional areas that exceed allowances in soil to further reduce risk and or prevent impacts to groundwater and engineering and institutional controls. That has a price tag of 32.8 million to 57.8 million. Alternative five, capping of the approximately 140 acre landfill area, capping and or excavation of additional areas that exceed allowances to further reduce risk and or to prevent impacts to groundwater and engineering and institutional controls. That has a current price tag of 55.4 million. EPA has determined that groundwater impacts will not be addressed in this feasibility study and will be monitored and addressed later. EPA presented the potential alternatives at public meetings in June 2018 and in response to that meeting, this community advisory group was formed in September of 2018. The CAG purpose is to provide a public forum for the community to present and discuss their needs and concerns and to offer input to EPA in the cleanup process. The CAG applied for and received a technical assistance grant from the EPA to hire a consultant to assist with document review and analysis. After putting out a request for proposals, the CAG interviewed five potential consultants and hired GEI who will present a summary of their review to date this evening. The Department of Interior explained that their view is that all landfill waste at the landfill site needed to be capped, consistent with EPA's presumed Superfund remedy for landfills to protect the ecologically sensitive natural resources and recreational users of the federally protected wilderness area of the National Wildlife Refuge. <laughs> 
DOI hired a consultant to evaluate the remedial investigation, baseline human health and ecological risk assessments, and the draft feasibility study. This assessment concluded that the landfill waste poses unacceptable risks to wildlife and recreational users at the refuge, and that significant areas of the refuge impacted by the landfill waste were not evaluated. DOI is in the initial stages of performing a data gap investigation on the refuge portion of the landfill, and their consultant will be presenting this evening as well. So with that, I'm done talking, and I'll be turning this over to our CAD consultants from GEI, Fran Schultz and Bob Blauvelt, to do their introduction and their presentation. And then we'll have a Q&A when they are done. Thanks for listening. All right, Fran and Bob, it's up to you guys. Fran, you're on mute. There you go. Good evening. Thank you, Sally. Um, that was an incredibly concise summary of uh, the goings on for this property. So um, just wanted to introduce Bob. Unfortunately, we can only share one of our cameras at a time. So you'll have to look at Bob's little personal image. But um, Bob Blauvelt is a senior, is a tech, the technical advisor for this work. He has over 30 years of experience. He has worked previously with DEP. He's got, trust me, an extensive resume of environmental projects that he's worked on here in the state of New Jersey, including landfills, tons of groundwater and soil investigations and doing site investigation for remediations. He is an LSRP. He is a certified hazardous materials manager. He's a professional geologist and has a PhD. And I'm sure if you want to ask him questions, he will be glad to give you more information. For myself, um, I'm an LSRP and a PG. I'm the project manager for this project. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in geology. I've been doing this for over 30 years as well. Most of my work has been in New Jersey, although it has been pretty much all over the country at times. I do site investigations. I do site remediation. I do brownfields. And I have worked on several major construction projects. So our agenda in this is to briefly walk you through where we are, what we've reviewed, what, um, what we see as some of the potential issues primarily with the feasibility study, but also with the RI, and then to be available to answer your questions. We received from the Great Swamp Watershed 24 documents in response to a formal Freedom of Information Act request, many of which were correspondence, others were technical documents, figures, tables, appendices. We also downloaded 12 documents from the EPA Rolling Knowles Landfill Superfund website. We got an additional five documents from the Great Swamp Watershed Association um, on January 4th containing documents that were submitted by EPA um, or yeah in December and again you know our objective is to look at the evaluate the um, adequacies of the recommended remedies that are out there and to just give some of our feedback from our professional experience here in New Jersey So there were a key, couple of key documents that we got from the EPA website that we had not gotten directly from the Great Swamp Watershed Association, including a risk assessment from 2006, the original remedial investigation report, the screening level ecological assessment, and baseline human health assessment. Some of these documents have been later revised, um, but these were the key documents. 
from the FOIA request, we got the July 2018 feasibility study, including the figures, tables, appendices, and we got, I can't even keep track, um, correspondence that went back and forth between EPA, the Department of Interior, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, the Township of Chapman, the Chow Township of Milmer, and the attorney for the PRP group, Lowenstein Sandler. And we've also looked at DOI compliance memoranda that were referenced in some of the letters, as well as EPA's most recent comments to the feasibility study. So looking at these documents, I know that um, Sally gave a really good history, but some of the things that we particularly noted were that they found in addition to the industrial waste, over a hundred intact drums containing all of stuff, various colors, blue, white, fibrous, not fibrous, solids, those, and then this is as was mentioned the, within the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge Wilderness Area. Um, and that I wanted to draw your attention to the figure. Uh, Sally mentioned that there were plans in several of the alternatives to cap or excavate the selected area. And the selected area came out of the remedial investigation and is the area in pink on this figure. So you have the footprint of the entire landfill, which goes like this, and it goes out into the refuge area. And it's a fairly significant 170 acres of landfill. The selected area is only this very small portion of the landfill that by capping this area significantly reduces the risks of exposure associated with the whole landfill, but it doesn't deal with contaminants on a point by point basis. We've also been talking about the refuge and I just want to show you where the refuge is and who owns what properties within the landfill area. So in gold, you have the refuge and its border. In the pink and red, you have the era, area of the Mealy Trust. And this little green area up here is the shooting range and ball field. And the game plan is that after the remediation, none of this area will be used for anything. It will be either fenced off, access will be limited to trespassers, and if allowed, passive recreation. That's still something that's being discussed. Passive recreation being defined as hunting, walking, bird watching, and that's about it. The trust already has documents that preclude future development. The EPA restrictions will preclude development on all these properties, but will even further limit access to those properties for any reason, um, depending upon how they're written. We don't know what the final form of those documents are gonna be. This is also excerpted from the July 2018 feasibility study. And I know that Sally went through the soil remediation alternatives and their costs, but it's kind of important to note that the feasibility study as it stands right now, um, includes both soil and groundwater remediation alternatives. And that the groundwater remediation alternatives, again, there's a no further action alternative zero cost, but that doesn't meet the National Contingency Plan requirements. There's source control and monitoring, which is 1,345,000, 
and source control with a contingent monitoring, which is 2.8 million. And what the difference between source control monitoring and source control with a contingency is source control monitoring in normal New Jersey usage is that you have contamination that will go away over time and you're monitoring to show that the extent of the contamination is stable or contracting. If your plume is not stable, your groundwater impacts are not stable or contracting, then you have to plan for further mitigation, whether it's an injection, whether it's biologic, whether it means further removal of the source material. So there's a synergy between the soil remediation options and their impact on the groundwater remediation options that may be selected in the future. So we looked at the preliminary remediation, I'm sorry, we looked at the remediation investigation and we noticed that it expressly said that they did not develop remediation goals for ecological exposures. They basically said, whatever we do will be fine. And I don't mean to put words in their mouth, but in essence, they were not addressed specifically. They were addressed by saying, when we do other things, this will address ecological exposures. But we don't really know that because they didn't evaluate that separately. We also noted that they deferred contaminant delineation to the remedial design phase. And that has some consequences. Um, there are a number, I forget the exact number, I think it's, hold on a sec, oops. I don't even know how to go back, hold on. There we go. Um, they identified a number of what they call, what are in termed areas of uh, particular interest. And these areas of particular interest are outside of the selected area for remediation and include areas where they know there's where analyses and visual um, evidence have indicated there is something there that should be removed whether it's pesticides, whether it's lead, whether it's PCBs, whether it's drums. And the plant, so when you see in the, uh, the alternative, the description of and particular areas of concern, that's what they're talking about, is pockets, little pockets that are gonna be dug up. In my experience, and Bob can attest to this on his own, when you go into a remediation to excavate a small area, unless you've done a lot of characterization, these areas get, even with characterization, you're always gonna find more than you expected. So the costs are very variable based on what you're gonna find. It could be extensive enough that it changes what you might want the remediation selection to be. But we won't know that in this case because that isn't being done until the preliminary design phase after the alternate remedial alternative is already selected. Um, we noticed also that the distribution of contaminant impacts for the selected area ends arbitrarily at the refuge border, even though there are some samples outside of that boundary in the, within the refuge that have concentrations of PCBs that are significant and probably should be included within the select area. Which brings me to one other point. I just wanted to point out clearly to people that there are portions of the landfill extending into the refuge, which based on some of these alternatives, alternatives two and three, would not be capped at all. They're just gonna be left with up to the deepest parts of the landfill are up to 15 feet deep, could be up to 15 feet of waste material. And that waste material is in contact with water and could potentially come in contact with the surface water. In the discussion 
in the um, feasibility study regarding surface water, they used the argument, the argument was presented that contamination hasn't reached the surface water bodies yet. And if it does, it won't be significant. As an LSRP in New Jersey, this is not an argument that New Jersey allows. EPA has their own rules. I'm just saying that the New Jersey, under the New Jersey SARA law, that would not be accept an acceptable explanation. Um, so I've been talking about all these, most of these things as I've talked, I'm not quite as succinct as Sally uh, in, my, in my presentation, but the recommended alternative of alternative three leaves not only surficial debris, but uncapped landfill waste within the refuge. And the planned restraints, uh, restrictions would prohibit any future use of that area. Maybe for passive use, maybe not for passive use. That seems to still be a question being resolved. And what's next? We know that the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing some additional characterization. So I already mentioned that. EPA is revised, has been asked to revise the FS for soils only. And that's supposed to be due in early 2021. EPA has said they will complete their review of the Fish and Wildlife Service technical memorandum from October with by in February. And I think that is all I have. So I can open it to questions if you want, Sally. Sally, you can unmute yourself. I just temporarily uh, turned off that ability, but. <laughs> yes, uh, Matt Roby, if you can facilitate. I didn't notice any questions come up into the, oh yeah, I guess there are some. I'm not looking at the chat. Um, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, if you can. Uh, appears to be no questions in the chat at this time. Yeah, no, yeah. I think th I think there's just people chiming in on um, their status and wanting to be added. Um, I will be honest, my connection was a little bit dicey, so I lost a couple of your key points. Um, but I think one, um, one key point that I thought was pointed out here was that we have <clears throat> issues related to groundwater synergy between soil and soil and groundwater remedial alternatives and that those, those things are going to be important moving forward. Um, it sounds like later in the meeting, um, we'll we'll hear more about um, the status of the <clears throat> the status of the DOI's investigation. Um, but I think one question that I have for the for the technical advisors would be, what's the next? what would be the next step for the technical assistance in, in your sort of, in your program? Where, where will the information that you've compiled so far go, I guess? Um, um, let me, somebody tell me if I'm muted or not. I can't tell. You're good. I can hear you. Okay. Um, we're in the process of preparing a summary of all the documents with our technical opinion, which we will be submitting to the watershed or to the, to the CAG group. So I, I have a memo from GEI from September, which I'm fairly certain has been posted on our website. If not, I'll certainly make sure it is. I think it's there. But since September, 
we've received many more documents through uh, Freedom of Information Act request. Like literally, I just got some last week. So they have not had the opportunity to review them. And um, Stephanie and I have an uh, arrangement where they're uploading documents to me once a month with the hope of being done with the FOIA request by April. So that still leaves February, March, and April, three more months of documents. So as I get them, I obviously send them to Fran and Bob, and then they get reviewed and hopefully incorporated into some kind of a review memo. Okay, so um, for, G for GEI, it sounds like your, um, your process will be to review documents and provide technical memos with your sort of opinions on each of those technical documents. Is that fair? Um, yes, we're doing a review. We're not doing, in many cases, a critical technical review. That's beyond the scope for us yep. right now. Um, and it would be duplicating work that people are doing. We're taking um, a high level view for the most part of what are the documents and is there something that's jumping out as a worth comment, worth or problem to be considered or for investigated. Okay. Matt, take a look. There seem to be two questions um, that popped up in the chat. Yep. All right, so the first from Lisa is FOIA request customary in retrieving information from EPA and local government. That's from Lisa. Do you want to take that, Sally, or should I? I? I don't know the answer. I just know I submitted one. I don't know if it's customary or not. If you guys have more experience, you may know if it's common. It, it is certainly in New Jersey common to submit the New Jersey equivalent, which is an Open Records, Open Records Act request. And you can submit that for any New Jersey case um, and almost anything in New Jersey, actually. And um, you, it is not uncommon for people to submit FOIA requests to uh, federal agencies. Okay, and then the second part of that question is, um, was the presence of drums a surprise? Um, that might be a question for EPA or for the PRPs. Uh, Christina, can you unmute Stephanie or can she unmute herself? I don't know. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, you're able to uh, unmute right now, so. Okay, yeah. sorry, I tried before and I couldn't. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, first, I'd agree, FOIA requests are very common. Um, we get them all the time. Um, and the second question regarding the drums, no, we, we've known about the drums since the probably before the RI started, it was not a surprise at all. Um. All right, um, next question is um, from Michael. Uh, GEI seems to think that most of the recommendations are insufficient, um, almost sweeping under the table the possibility of plumes and worse continuing into the refuge. How do we present that? Um, I can answer that, but I think Bob might be better to answer yeah. that. Yeah, well, well, certainly at this stage of the process, at, the, at this stage of the process, this kind of technical give and take uh, is quite common. And it's really the intent of the reviews is to point out areas where we think additional consideration needs to be applied. Um, so, inadequate might be a, a strong word for it, uh, but uh, we certainly have some concerns which we're uh, making known to the stakeholders that we think need to be addressed in a, in a way that achieves the objectiveness of being, of the final remedy, uh, whichever is selected, of being protective of both public health and the environment. 
Okay. A um, couple, there's another question. How much does the baseline ecological risk assessment that was completed several years ago help in assessing eco risk to the wildlife in the Great Swamp and WR? Again, how much does the BIRA help in assessing risk to wildlife in the swamp, in the Great Swamp? seem like a Stephanie question also, I'm not sure. Sorry. Um, I, excuse me, I could, I could answer that. I also, I mean, I have a few um, things I'd, I'd like to point out related to what um, was presented. I don't know if this is an appropriate time. I don't want to, I don't want to overstep, but um, the the but to address the question, um, the BERA was so, so we have a multi-step process in the Superfund program. We start out by conducting what's called a screening level ecological risk assessment, and that involves some sampling, some analysis of the data to determine if it is worth going in its historical information about the site um, to determine if it is worth going forward with a full or necessary to go forward with a full baseline ecological risk assessment. At a site such as this, it was no surprise that the screening level assessment supported going forward with a full BARA baseline ecological risk assessment. That assessment covered um, spatially the entire landfills area. Um, and, and when I say landfills area, the entire area we define the borders by the presence of any waste. Um, so it was not uniformly landfilled. It was, you know, there's, there's waste in, in pockets in some areas. There's lots, some areas there's not as much. But so the full ecological risk assessment that was conducted covered the entire site, um, including any portions that go on to the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge which was part of the landfilling operation. Um, and um, it included all kinds of sampling for biota, for toxicity, um, surface water sediment. Um, it was a whole very involved technical investigation and analysis that was conducted. Um, the results of that, I guess to answer the question, we think are sufficient. They showed that there is an unacceptable ecological risk so they support, it supports taking action at the site. Um, EPA, you know, we must follow our regulations and our, and our laws. Um, so in the RIFS process, sorry, in the remedial investigation and feasibility study process, we, we, it is a process. And one of the first things to do is to determine if there are unacceptable risks at the site. And if there are unacceptable risks, then we have a basis to take action. So in this case, both the human health and ecological risks at the site were found to be elevated. They were found to be marginally elevated, but elevated. So we do have a basis to take action. Um, one of the conclusions of the report that the GI put together is that um, the human health risks were found to be more important than the ecological risks. And that is, that's not how we would frame things. Um, the risks are different. Both are elevated, so, so action is required to lower the risks to within acceptable levels. Um, one of the points, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm, this is the first time I'm hearing the presentation, so I apologize if I'm a bit all over the place. But one of the um, statements that, I'm sorry, what was your first name, Fiona? Yeah, okay. That, that she made, what was that? Sorry. Um. Okay. Um, with that, the, um, I'm sorry, now I lost my train of thought. Um, that the, that we weren't addressing, that we were sort of writing off the ecological risks. Um, and that is, that is not the case. Um, what the full analysis that will be included in the revised FS report, which no one has seen yet because it hasn't been revised, um, will include, will show that by addressing the 
human health risks, it will also address the ecological risks. Now, that is, that is our conclusion based on the data. However, whatever alternative is selected to address the cleanup, to address the contamination and the risks at the site would include post-implementation monitoring to assure that the risks, both to human health and the environment, are fully addressed. And if additional action were needed, it would be taken. Um, this also relates to the groundwater, um, but I don't want to overstep. But, but one thing I do want to say clearly is that we have not yet come out in any form or any way and said what our preferred alternative is. At one point you said that our preferred alternative, we have not yet done that. And the FS itself will, will not, the first draft that you looked at, that we did not share because we have so many comments on it. That is why we didn't share it publicly. But it's, you know, one of the, um, it may have, I don't recall, it may have said in there what the PRP's preferred alternative was. But that is one of the things that needs to be removed from the revised document. We do not say what our preferred alternative is, what EPA's preferred alternative is, until the proposed plan is released. So I just want to make that order clear. We have not yet come out and said our preferred alternative at this site is X and these are the details. We don't even have a report to, on which to support that. The 2018 feasibility study will change significantly from the version, from its current version. In, and, you know, notably by the removal of the groundwater. Um, all right. Any further, any further discussion on that? Fiona, if you're talking, you're on mute. Fran. Her name's Fran. Oh, Fran. Sorry. No, I'm not saying anything. Okay. Matt, there's another question in the chat. Yep. Yep. So we have, um, we have a question from Dot. Uh, EPA assumes there will be no human use except for trespassers. The demand for trails is increasing. Wetlands can have boardwalks, dense vegetation can be trimmed. That assumption is incorrect. Cleanup needs to be to human use. Will that assumption be made? Um, just to, um, but I think that's a good, that's a good, that's a question I think for EPA to respond to. I also think one of the things that I recall there being, um, if you all recall back to probably over, probably close to two years ago now, we had, we had some presentations and discussions on both the baseline human health and the ecological risk assessment at prior CAG meetings. And in the, in the baseline human health one, I remember we had fairly fairly significant discussion about this issue where on the landfill that's private property we talk about the potential the potential use of that property now as trespass and we talk about the use on the wildlife refuge property as or the documents talk about the potential use of the refuge property as as passive recreational use or passive yeah, passive recreation, and that those two things are considered to be two different types of, you know, human exposure pathways, human populations that would be at risk. Um, and I think maybe, maybe to clarify that question for Stephanie, are the trespassers and ecologic and recreators, are they the same risk or are they treated separately in the risk assessment? So, um, yeah, a few, a few points on that. First, there's the private portion of the site, which is approximately 140 acres, and then there's the, the federal portion, um, the remaining 35 acres or so. Um, the private owner of the private property um, has placed a restrictive covenant on it. So it currently cannot be used for anything other than 
it, it can't be used for anything. They, they have restricted access. So the only legal access to the site would be a trespasser or, you know, or illegal access to the site. Um, for, the, for the Great Swamp portion, that is absolutely accessible. Um, you know, in terms of that the, the wildlife refuge is open to anyone who wants to use it in a passive recreational way. Now it is part of the wilderness area. So, you know, it's, the uses are limited um, in terms of they, they should be passive recreational uses. Um, now from the risk assessment standpoint, when we look at the, the criteria that are used to determine the risks to those two groups, we actually um, treated them, it, it, it turns out that they were the same. And I believe there was consensus even with DOI and Fish and Wildlife on this point, meaning that we assumed that people would use the site very conservatively. I haven't looked at the numbers in a while because it's, you know, we haven't met in a while, but I think it was 84 days a year um, for several hours a day. So that there might be a person who goes out there, um, I forget the exact way we calculated the numbers, but something like every day for three months of the year um, to go say bird watching. Um, and every three days for the, uh, for the other six months of the year. Um, and then likely not over the winter months when the ground is frozen anyway. So, you know, we made very conservative assumptions that a recreational user, how a recreational user might use the site. And that is how we conduct our risk assessments with an API. Um, and we use the same criteria for the trespasser. I hope that was clear, but that's, that's the, uh, I hope that addresses the question. Matt, we still have a couple more questions. Are you there? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a couple more. There was a follow-up to that, um, the conversation about the private property. Uh, Dot followed up with Miele Conservation Easement allows passive recreation. Will that be addressed by the EPA? Um, the, 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 the whatever alternative is selected would be protective of the passive recreator. That's another way of saying what I said on both the public and the private portion. Sorry, I was on mute before and I was trying to paraphrase that. I, that, was, that was my understanding of what you had said and you said it very clearly there. Um, All right, next, um, private property may not always remain in trust ownership, but if the use changes to include passive recreation with a new owner, um, that, that is, uh, that's another question for you, Stephanie. Well, I, I think the, um, I mean, that it would be the same answer that I just gave. Um, yep. If a new owner wanted to use it for passive recreation, the, the cleanup would be protective of the passive recreator. If a new owner wanted to come in and make it residential, um, then it would not be protective. Um, but we had gone through several years ago a, um, a reuse assessment, and there was also widespread agreement that nobody wanted this developed residentially. There's a follow up to that, which is COVID and pandemic has changed our lives, and that maybe. 80, maybe the number of days assumed at 84 days per year is um, undercounting the number of days that people are maybe available to be recreating in that way. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> 
Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's a fair question. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer off the bat, but I can say that, um, that, that, and I think it was 84 days, um, Sukinder, John, I don't know if you, if you could confirm that, but, um, it was a, it was a conservative assumption. So, you know, when we, when we do risk assessments and this might be getting too much in the weeds, we don't look at the, um, the average user. Most people would probably use it less than that. We look at like the, the avid user <laughs> um, in this case, you know. So um, if, if anyone has any, any, um, Sabrina just confirmed, it was 84 days. Um, if anyone has any, you know, knowledge that people are using this regularly on a more frequent basis, you know, feel free to let us know. And I'm not talking about the Great Swamp as a whole. I mean, the, the, the impacted portions. I'm sure there are portions of the Great Swamp that people do utilize on a more frequent basis. All right, are there any more questions? We're right on time here. We have, time, we have two more minutes if people want to keep asking questions here for this Q&A. Can I, can I make one more point, and maybe I shouldn't do this, but I just want to clarify something. Um, yep. Is that okay, Sally? I don't want to. Absolutely. Okay. Um, one of the other sort of fundamental um, aspects of the alternatives that are included in the, um, in the draft of the FS that, that you reviewed, as well as will be included in the revised FS. Um, first off, no action. We are required by law to include no action. So please don't take that as a, you know, that EPA wants to take no action here. We have, there is an un unacceptable risk, so we must take action. Um, alternative five is capping the entire 170 acres that contain waste. Um, so that one's clear. The alternatives three and four, which are the the capping or excavating the selected area and then capping the additional areas um, or excavating additional areas. I just want to make clear that those alternatives include addressing all portions of the site that exceed the cleanup goals for the site and preventing exposure to contamination in all portions of the site where the cleanup number is exceeded. Um, that did not come through clearly in the first draft of the FS, which is one of the reasons that we wanted it, that it needed to be significantly revised. But I just want to make that clear that the intention was not to just cap or excavate this 25 acres, um, the selected area, and then leave the rest of the site as is. That was never um, part of the FS alternatives. You're saying that all risks, all unacceptable risks were to be addressed through excavation or through capping if that's, that's what the, is intended by the, those, those alternatives that include either excavation or capping to address risk, that they're, that they're addressing not just the pink area, but also the areas outside that are the pockets there's, where there's residual risk. Correct. And, the, and we've, we've explained this at CAG meetings, and I think it was the September 2019 CAG meeting. Yep. We went through this in detail. Um, but I, I just wanted to reiterate it here because it, um, you know, we, we, all alternatives are still on the table. Um, we have not yet said what our preferred alternative is. But if we were to select alternatives three, four, or five, which are the either limited capping excavation or the full capping of the entire area. Um, we would only select an alternative that addressed all risks. And we would then monitor <laughs> to, oh, and, and one other point, um, but I'll, I'll hold off on this point. It's related to the pre-design investigation, but um, I don't want to take away from the agenda. That's fine. Um, I think we're, let's move on to the next thing. And if there's time, I think you can come back to pre-design. Okay. 
Yeah, there's going to be another half hour of Q and A at the end, so hopefully we'll get to a lot more questions. All right, All right. So, Preston, Callie, you're back up. to you. Yeah, Preston, you're up. If you can do, you know, or I, I apologize, Preston, you're not up. George, you're up first. I'm waiting for this camera to turn on here. Well, I'll start without it. Um, well, anyway, thanks, Sally. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll, I'm just going to keep my, my part brief here. Um, I want to let our presentation um, do a lot of the talking, um, which hopefully will spur a really productive and informative uh, Q&A session uh, afterwards. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, as, as Fran noted and Sally noted, um, the RI has been the RI has already been completed, um, but um, Fish and Wildlife, it's, it's our belief that there's, there's several key limitations in our understanding um, of the landfill. Um, it's also our belief that there's not a whole lot of information um, about the contaminants and their concentrations at depth throughout the waste pile, um, in particular that portion of the site that's on the refuge. Um, we're, also of the, <clears throat> we're also of the belief that the movement of groundwater through this waste pile requires further study um, as it still could be a continuing source of uh, further contamination migrating into the wetlands that surround the site um, and also onto the refuge. Um, so as, as Fran noted um, and, and Sally, um, this is one of the reasons, these are some of the reasons why Fish and Wildlife feels that um, this additional investigation is needed to address these data gaps which we're hoping and in turn will, it's gonna help us better understand how the landfill is currently functioning now and what the likelihood of future contamination will be. Um, key components of what we plan to do in, during that investigation um, is, to <clears throat> is to include a further characterization of soils, uh, both surficial and at depth. Um, also uh, some additional sediment surface water and sediment pore water sampling. Um, and we're hoping that we're going to have, we're, we're, we're anticipating that field activities are going to occur probably somewhere in early to mid spring of this year. Um, once we get the results of that, that field investigation, um, Fish and Wildlife uh, plans to share that with EPA, uh, NJDEP, and the public. Um, and if results of our investigation indicate that the extent of contamination on the refuge is greater than what is currently presented in the RI, um, Fish and Wildlife Service will ask EPA and the PRP group to address those issues um, as appropriate. Um, our ultimate intent of this additional investigation um, is again to ensure that the refuge-owned portion of the site uh, is adequately, ca adequately uh, characterized and that based on the, um, the data collected, um, an appropriate remedy will be selected. Um, a remedy that fully addresses fish and wildlife, uh, fish and wildlife's concerns. Um, it's, it's going to improve our ability to manage the refuge own portion of the site um, consistent with the Wilderness Act, because um, the site is located within, completely within a designated wilderness area. Um, but and also it would tend to minimize the potential for future problems associated with the overall administration of the landfill. Um, it's, it's always been our position that um, the potential for future migration of contamination from the landfill, um, continued presence of contaminated wastes um, in the refuge wilderness area, um, habitat improvements following any type of disturbances um, and public access, there, they're going to be an important consideration to any remedy selected for the landfill. Um, so our, our vision, our ultimate vision for the site is that the landfill is appropriately managed to ensure that the refuge remains an asset to the community. Um, that's pretty much what sums everything up. Um, so now I'm going to hand this over to uh, Preston Sowell. He's our consultant. Um, and he's going to discuss in greater detail some of these data gaps that were that they that he along with um, our uh, 
other consultant um, identified and how we plan to move forward with, with our investigation. So Preston, I, I leave it to you. Thanks, George, and good evening, everyone. I think I met some of you uh, probably going on a year, a half, year and a half ago during one of our meetings. Um, so some of you are familiar with some of this material. Let me see if I can get back to my presentation here, stand by. There we are. Okay, can everyone see that all right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and you can hear me then, I assume. All right, well, I'm gonna skip through the uh, intro parts because I think we've done that a couple times and you're all bright enough to have absorbed it by now. Um, this is all about our landfill. Um, so this is the site, the pink line again, um, outlines the area of landfill waste that had been delineated to date. Uh, the green blobs there show you the portion of the landfill that is on the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and that's delineated by the gold line that you see there. Um, so anything south of that down in here and out here to the east, that's all part of the refuge. Um, so as George mentioned, you know, we, we came in, we evaluated the site from uh, the fish and wildlife perspective and identified a number of data gaps that kind of concerned us relative to the characterization of the contamination that was on the refuge portion of the site. Um, and here's one example of that. Um, these are all um, soil sample locations. These represent surface soil lo sample locations, just these, these red and yellow dots here. And um, just simply drawing a, a couple polygons around that site, we can see very large areas without any surface soil characterization. Um, seven and a half acres, for example, up in the Northeast, eight and a half acres down South, and you can see many of those dots relative to the scale are upwards of 200 feet apart. Um, that was concerning relative to some of the very high concentrations of contaminants that we saw in surface soils in other hotspots around the site. Um, the other thing was sediment. Um, this illustrates some of the uh, sediment, soil, uh, sediment samples that were collected as part of the uh, risk assessment. Um, so these guys in here, and these, these represent um, lead concentrations that were measured in that sediment. Um, so the, this group here is located adjacent to the wildlife refuge. And then you see some upgrading ones up in here that had some lead concentrations. Um, one of our concerns was the distance between those. Um, because if we want to attribute any contamination that potentially came from upstream, um, to sediment contamination that we see adjacent to the site here, we kind of need to know, you know, what's going on along that reach. Um, and here's another illustration of that. These are all of the sediment samples that were collected around the site. Um, you can see there are a few, you know, along this edge here. Um, if you look at the scale, many of those are, are quite a ways apart, but quite a few more here. Um, then you see Black Brook here. There are a few quite a ways upstream, and in that southern branch of Black Brook, a few down in here. But if you look at those just as a crow flies, you know, it's quite a distance. Um, 3,600 feet up high, of course, that's much longer in river miles, um, and almost a mile in that southern reach um, to these samples down here. So to us, that's a real data gap, you know, in, in determining whether any contamination um, came from up here that could have contributed to contamination down here. And relative to the distribution of these sediment samples, we noticed a couple of things. Uh, one stood out. If you see this pond here in the northeast, and I'll blow up that, these arrows represent what the RI determined were surface water flows from and around the site. Um, these areas here up in the north, they're some of the most highly contaminated soils that were slated for excavation. And we can see that that surface water flows into that pond area where we would expect those contaminated sediments to accumulate and potential surface water to be contaminated as well. And then we show that fly out, flowing back out, let me back up there, back out into Black Brook and, and south of there. And then you see this ponding area 
upgradient here where we would expect any contamination from upgradient to also accumulate. And we don't see any sem sediment samples there. So that's an area that was concerning us as well. Um, this is a slide that illustrates groundwater movement around the site. So these contours sort of show you how that's moving. Um, groundwater kind of flows into the site from the north and then spreads out. Um, and in the south and in the east here, that all then flows directly into the wildlife refuge, into the swamp. Um, those arrows also illustrate that flow. Um, we can see our monitoring wells by these stars here. They're illustrated by those stars. Some of these are upwards of 900 feet apart. Um, we do have groundwater contamination exceeding some of the screening levels at those sentinel wells. So those are right at the edge of the landfill, but we don't know what's going on out here in the swamp. We expect that water to be flowing into the swamp at some point. Um, that's been assumed in the RI as well. Um, but we don't know what's going on between these points. And again, we don't know where those concentrations are daylighting out into the swamp. So that for us was a, a relatively big data gap. Um, to summarize those findings, um, we found that there were a few sediment and surface water samples from the refuge area and especially directly up gradient that would allow us to understand what's going on with that sediment contamination. We had some concerns for contaminated groundwater discharging into the refuge wetlands and along with that, you know, where that would discharge into the wetlands that can contaminate the sediments that are out in the wetlands that um, people and especially critters can be exposed to invertebrates, things that eat those invertebrates that live in that sediment layer and also the surface water at those locations. And we haven't seen a ton of surface water contamination to date at the site. So I think that's good news, um, but it's, it, it could be a concern relative to those smaller areas where that is daylighting or areas we've missed sampling further out into the swamp. Um, and as we noted, there are large areas on the refuge with no surface soil data relative to contamination and very few subsurface samples that would give us an idea of where hot spots might be in that landfill on the refuge portion of the site that could not only contribute contamination to soil there, but also contribute contamination to groundwater that's then flowing into the refuge. And one question as well is, has that contamination that's in the landfill itself moved down to contaminate some of the deeper soils? And if we're starting to look at some remedial options, that's something we need to take into account as well. Um, and here's a, a graphical conceptual site model. This is one we had presented in our last uh, presentation there at the meeting. Um, this sort of helps us graphically illustrate what we know is going on at the site, what we think might be going on at the site. Um, you can see the landfill illustrated here in cross section. Um, the, this conceptually is it, the west would be here, so east is out here, so this would be our refuge property, the gold line delineating that here. Um, you see our landfill wastes, um, our native soils below that we were talking about, and then we know below that there's this impermeable clay layer that we do not expect contaminants to move through, groundwater doesn't move through that. Um, that's good news for deeper groundwater in the area. Um, see some of the animals that we know live in the area that might be exposed to those contaminants. Um, bird watcher, you know, some of our human receptors that might be there. We're illustrating all of that. Um, th this is the swamp out in here, um, that transition in here. And this is not to scale, of course just very mocked up. And so then on that, we can kind of start conceptualizing how contaminants might move around here. Um, for instance, you know, we get precipitation, we know falls on the landfill. Um, many of those contaminated sediments, landfill waste are not covered. Um, and that creates overland flow that then flows off the landfill into low-lying areas, one being the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge adjacent to that that can entrain those sediments and soils and take that contamination down into the swamp and contribute to contaminated sediments in the water there. And we know we have contaminated groundwater below the landfill that's already been documented. Um, that's continuing to flow through those wastes and that flows out into that wetland at some point. Um, and contaminated sur surface water there, again, we haven't seen a ton to date 
but we don't have a lot of data um, to make us terribly confident that we won't see um, some contaminated surface water out there. And of course, then we have that potential contaminant migration through the landfill down into those native soils below. And that could contribute to the overall volume of waste that we would have to manage at some point. Um, so that brings us to the data gap sampling analysis plan that we developed uh, with Fish and Wildlife to try to address some of these concerns, kind of fill some of these data gaps just relative to the refuge property. Um, purpose of that is to conduct a, a supplemental investigation to kind of fill those data gaps. As I mentioned, the goal is not to redo any of those previous investigations. It's just to complement them and generate data that would sort of help us develop a more sound picture of the site in our minds, at least relative to the refuge portion of the property. Um, and then we can combine those data and start to fill those data gaps and make some decisions around that um, relative to the contaminated sediment, poor water we'll talk about later, surface water, groundwater, soil, and then the landfill wastes on that property. Um, our study questions then that we developed are what are the distributions and concentrations of contaminant, contaminants on and adjacent to the refuge portion of the site, and that's in uncharacterized areas. So where we don't already have data, that's what we're concerned about right now, filling those data gaps. Um, asking the same questions about distributions and concentrations in surface water, um, and contaminants within poor water and sediments in those potential groundwater discharge areas where we think that groundwater is discharging into surface water out into the swamp. Um, that, that's sort of a, a narrow area where we could have some higher concentrations of those contaminants. That hasn't been looked at today and it's something we're, we're concerned with now. Um, addition to that are other areas of poor water and by poor water we mean very shallow groundwater. Um, at most of the times of the year the the groundwater is right below the surface here. In some areas where it's saturated, that could even be in the biotic zone, where we see invertebrates living in that, in that poor water. Um, and they can, the chemistry can be different there. The contaminants can be more concentrated. So we're going to be concerned with that in certain areas around the property. And of course, what are the distributions and concentrations of soil contaminants? And what are the chemical properties of that layer below the landfill? Uh, here's an illustration of our um, sampling plan spatial boundary that's represented by this um, green cross hatching here. We sort of wanted to constrain the boundary. You know, we don't need to investigate the entire wilderness area, um, just areas where we know or think there might be contamination. Um, and so that is represented by this cross hatching here. Um, and very important to our study is you know, where that wetland transitions, where we might see that, that groundwater discharging into the wetlands. Um, and these are data um, that were generated by previous studies, um, but this is done via a wetland survey of the site. Um, you can see the cross hatching here represents true wetlands they've delineated. Um, they stopped, of course, going east. so that black line is just arbitrary. That just means the end of their wetland survey. We expect that to extend all the way out here. And then we've got this sort of 150 foot, um, what they call a, a wetlands transitional area. And that's where we're transitioning from the highland areas into wetlands. So the, the vegetation changes there, um, the amount of time that that soil is saturated changes, but also the chemistry can change there. And here's an up close version of that. Um, so you can see that that boundary here, um, and we're also calling that a, a geochemical transition boundary. Um, and I'll explain, I'll touch on that here. Uh, here's a blow up of our conceptual site model, um, just the refuge portion of the area. So you can see the, the boundary here, our transition from the landfill waste into soils, um, into the wetland. We have our sediments here invertebrates living down in that sediment and you know other critters that, that live out in the wetland um, our contaminated groundwater flowing out and then at some point you know we're expecting that we know it, it discharges out into the wetlands so if you see standing water out in those wetlands in dry periods that's essentially groundwater that's all in, in hydraulic communication that's what we're concerned with here 
Um, and that's what we're calling sort of this wetlands geochemical transition zone. Um, so at some point, and when that water flows out, the water under the landfill that's flowing through those wastes is highly reduced. Um, there's no oxygen in it. It's in a different oxidation state. Um, and that means a couple of things. You know, one, it has contaminants in it you wouldn't see in oxygenated water. Um, it'll be very high in dissolved metals like iron and manganese. Um, other metals will move around in this water that will not move around in oxygenated water, that sort of thing. So as that moves out into the wetlands and it contacts the atmosphere, um, the chemistry can change and we can see things like metals precipitating out of that solution. We can see those chemicals concentrating. Um, some organic um, contaminants can change state. They can sorb with some of the organic material in the swamp there. Um, several things we look at. And they can also become more toxic in those discharge areas to these invertebrates that are living there. And likewise to anything that might be eating those invertebrates. Um, here's an illustration of the samples uh, that we plan to take across the site. Um, the red dots here represent soil samples. Um, so you can see in the southern portion here, we've got those around the, the landfill. In this northeast portion, we've got a few. Uh, the triangles represent sediment samples. Um, we'll have a few sediment samples that are not delineated in location right now. We'll determine those in the field just based on professional judgment where we see standing water that we're concerned about. And then we've got these transects here that will help us determine those geochemical transition areas. Um, and here's a, a close up of that northeast area. So we've got our sediment samples that will help us kind of delineate what might be coming in um, from the north there, what might be coming flowing into this ponding area and accumulating. And then here you see our transects going out into the swamp. So these will start in those wetlands transition areas. And what we're doing is looking for that geochemical transition zone. And we're also particularly looking for where that transition area geochemically tells us that that groundwater is in contact with surface water, where it might be flowing up through those sediments. We've got 25 of those transects all the way down that property, and we'll explain how many samples we have later. Uh, but here's sort of an illustration of what we plan to do. Um, relative to the soil samples, you know, we're concerned with what's right at the surface that animals, anybody moving along there might be exposed to, what might be transmit, transferred across the site in say the, the surface water flow. Um, and then we're gonna drill down and we wanna sample into that landfill wastes uh, across most of that column give us an idea of where hot spots might be, what contaminants might be in that waste on refuge property there. And then further down into those native soils in some areas to give us an idea of how mobile this stuff is vertically. You know, how far is it moving down? Do we have to be worried about large volumes of contaminated material we might have to manage down here? And then going to those transects, so there's an illustrator, if you think about one of those transects coming across here, what we're gonna do is drive a sample point down into the sediment, um, some, some feet below um, that sediment surface water um, interface. And we're gonna take a sample of the pore water that's there. It's a thing that's kind of a hollow tube with a, with a uh, mesh um, screen on it. Um, you'll drive that down, open it up, it'll fill with water. We'll be able to draw a sample from that and analyze that in the field for certain parameters like dissolved oxygen, 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 excuse me, um, um, ORP, it's a, 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 a thing that gives you some idea of the oxidation reduction potential of the um, water there, of the environment there. Um, we'll be analyzing for um, dissolved iron with field kits, things like dissolved iron, dissolved manganese. Um, as soon as that water becomes oxygenated, you'll really see those numbers drop quite a bit. And that'll give us an idea of what's going on geochemically there. So we'll keep moving out into that transect. And at some point we'll see an inflection point where that changes. And that should tell us where that geochemical transition zone is. We can collect our sample there. And that's where we'd expect to see the highest concentration of those contaminants coming from that groundwater into the land, into the, the wetland area. 
um, we'll collect our sample there and then keep moving down um, and do another transect. If we have any ambiguity, we'll collect two samples in one location. And of course, those other areas that we're targeting for sediment will also collect surface water in many of those locations. Relative to the number of samples, um, we'll have 30 surface and subsurface soil sample locations in total. 10 of those will be up in that northwest portion. 20 will be down in that southern portion. Uh, pour water samples from up to 25 locations. So those will be oriented along those 25 transects that I showed you earlier. And then we'll have 10 other locations that will be smattered around the terrestrial portions of the landfill. We know some of those areas are saturated most of the time based on the vegetation we see and just empirical observations from walking around out there. We want a good idea of you know, what's going on in the pore water in those areas where animals might be exposed that are not true wetland but are still saturated. Uh, sediment samples from up to 20 locations. And then we're going to limit the surface water samples to about 10 um, because we're just not seeing that much surface water uh, contamination out there. And we'll get a good idea of what's coming out in those pore water samples. And with that, that concludes our presentation. We can take questions on that now. George, do you have any comments on that or you want to just jump right into it? 